evening, everybody. As you, uh, as you probably know, if you've read the website, um, Peter is this evening um, going to talk on the second part of his tri trilogy um, linked to the to the uh, space shuttle. So Peter is a founder member of the Cleethorpes and District Astronomical Society, which celebrated its 50th anniversary last year in 2019. He started school in the same year that was the first that the first artificial satellite was launched, Sputnik 1, in October 1957. He has followed with great interest the exploration of space ever since. In April 1972, age 20, he was at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to see the launch of Apollo 16, the second to last Apollo moon landing mission. Now retired, he spends a lot of his time writing and giving lectures across the country to various astronomical societies. Since 2016, he's been contributing author to the annual Yearbook of, Ast of Astronomy, first published by Patrick Moore in 1962. And in December 2019, Peter was elected a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society for his constant can't say it, contributions to astronomy over the last 50 years. So please put your hands together and welcome Peter Rear. Thank you. Okay. Right, well, good evening, everyone. And I really appreciate being invited back to uh, talk to your great society uh, and for the opportunity of giving the second part to this trilogy uh, of the Space Shuttle. I've seen quite a few launches from the Kennedy Space Center and uh, Cape Canaveral, but I've never ever seen a shuttle launch and I would have liked to have done. For those who were here a couple of months ago uh, for part one, we discussed the very early origins of the shuttle, its concepts in the 50s and 60s with a potential flyback booster rather than a disposable external tank which, and solid fuel boosters, which is what we had now. We also looked at defining the body shape, which was done mostly through the 1960s with various X series experimental aircraft called lifting bodies to refine the shape of this vehicle, which would have to lift off vertically like a rocket and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, traveling at 25 times the speed of sound. And no aero vehicle had ever done that before. And we also looked at the final shuttle design, a compromise really on what NASA really wanted, which was a totally reusable orbiter and a totally reusable booster that would take it to significant altitude. In the end, we had, like we often have with um, aerospace vehicles, a compromise between what the engineers wanted and what the people who write the checks are prepared to pay for. And we ended up with a big external fuel tank, seen here in orange, and on the sides of which are two solid fuel boosters rather than liquid fuel. And there's the orbiter attached to the top of the tank and that's the concept that we got in the early to late 1970s prior to the first launch. So this is part two being described as satellite launcher which it wasn't particularly good at and repairman in which it excelled a capability which the Americans lost when the shuttle was retired in 2011. For those who saw the first part, the, we ended round about here on the eve of launch of uh, STS-1, Space Transportation System Flight 1. You'll notice in rather than having an orange external tank, it's white. It was painted white for the first two flights, but then to save weight, it was unpainted orange for the other 133 launches. So this is where we ended up on the eve of launch. 
and on the 12th of April 1981, Columbia left the launch pad for the first time, carrying a crew of two. I'd like to run through with you a launch to orbit, but cut down a bit because it takes about eight and a half minutes to get to orbit, and I just don't want to show you all eight and a half minutes. We'll just show various key phases. But rather than use the first flight of Columbia, I'm going to show you one of the very later ones because as the uh, program progressed, some of the photography and video of launches just got excellent, particularly once we knew the program was coming to an end. The, the launch photography was excellent. And I'm going to draw on that to show you a typical launch. So this we jumped, therefore, to flight STS-133, which was the last flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery. And we'll see it here on the launch pad, and we'll just see it launched and get it up into the air. And then we'll go through various phases to orbit. Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition, and the final liftoff of Discovery, a tribute to the dedication, hard work, and pride of America's space shuttle team. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. Right, we'll just pause it there and move on to the on to the next phase of the launch. But this, it's held on this quite deliberately because you're seeing two different types of rocket engine there. At the back of the Space Shuttle Orbiter, you can see three liquid fueled engines where the exhaust is virtually transparent. But the solid fueled boosters are extremely white and quite corrosive as well. They're quite dirty, but the liquid fuel engines are quite clean. You can see clearly there the difference between liquid fuel engines and solid fuel engines. So let's just move on to the next phase. So this is the launch again, but this time from a camera that's mounted on the left or port booster, as viewed from the back of the, uh, or the tail surfaces of the orbiter. So this uh, camera is looking down, so you'll see exactly the same sequence again, but from a different angle. Go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Two, one. Booster ignition and the final liftoff of Discovery. A tribute to the dedication, hard work, and pride of America's space shuttle team. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. Okay, let's move forward a bit. So now we're um, jumping forward about two minutes. You can still see the three liquid fuel engines burning, glowing white hot there, and the exhaust on the solid fuel boosters as well. So we'll, we'll see those two burn out. One minute, 50 seconds into the flight, we're standing by for separation of the twin solid rocket boosters. Discovery now traveling 2,695 miles an hour, its altitude 24 miles, the outrange from the Kennedy Space Center 29 miles. Okay, so that's the booster jettisoning. So let's see that. Again, but this time from that camera that's on the port booster looking down. Oops, I beg your pardon. Didn't trigger. Now traveling 2,695 miles an hour. It's altitude 24 miles. Downrange from the Kennedy Space Center 29 miles. So now you're riding along with one of the boosters. It's not falling to earth at this point. Discovery guidance is 
now converging as the shuttle's on board. So it's not going down at this point. It looks like it's falling towards Earth. But because at separation it was traveling at over 2,000 miles an hour, it continues to climb upward for quite some way until it loses energy, reaches apogee, and then uh, starts to fall back down to the ground. And here we can see one of the boosters at various phases. On the left, you can see the drogue chute just coming out to make sure the booster's in a vertical position. And then three main parachutes come out and slowly descend it down into the ocean for recovery and reuse. So these are reusable boosters. It takes so about six months to get them all cleaned up, uh, refilled with fuel, and back to the Kennedy Space Center. They have to go back to where they were made, uh, which is in the state of Utah, which is quite some distance from Florida. So there's one laying on its side, and there's the one of the recovery ships. Each booster has one recovery ship to tow it back to Port Canaveral, where it's then disassembled and the individual segments are taken by rail all the way over to Utah. Meanwhile, the uh, orbiter continues its climb into uh, space. Uh, it takes about eight and a half minutes, so this is approaching that eight and a half minute boundary where the external tank separates, which you can, if it will just trigger, which you will see separate. And there it goes. External tank falling away. And that will go about two thirds of the way around the Earth, re enter the Earth's atmosphere, and, uh, and break up. And this is a short movie taken out the window. And this is a replay of a video shot on board Atlantis earlier this afternoon of the external tank uh, after separation. This video. Uh shot through the uh, flight deck windows. And that goes, as I said, about two thirds of the way around the Earth. And here you can see the external tank re-entering the atmosphere over the Pacific, not far from Hawaii. So it's gone a fair way around the world. And uh, you can see it streaking in as, it, as the external tank just breaks up and nothing much really gets, gets back to the ground. It just about disintegrates on the way through. So after eight and a half minutes, we've gone from zero to about 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, where we reach uh, orbit. Uh, and that 17 and a half thousand miles an hour is an awful lot of kinetic energy. And on the subject of energy, I was once told in my physics classes that energy is neither created nor destroyed. I had that rammed down my throat a few times. So the chemical energy in the rocket fuel changes its state into potential and kinetic energy. So that energy is conserved. And of course, we'll look at that uh, energy is neither created nor destroyed in a short while when we see the uh, shuttle re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and its energy state changes again. Shortly after entering orbit, it was necessary to open the payload bay doors, which you can see hinged open here. That's not just so they can get a good look at the payload, it's because the inside those, pay, those payload bay doors are radiators, which helps dissipate heat. There is an awful lot of electronics on board the, uh, the shuttle orbiter, particularly in the forward cockpit area, and that generates quite a bit of heat. Um, and other instruments as well generate heat, which all has to be dissipated, otherwise it will just get seriously hot in there. So those payload bay doors act as radiators to dissipate it all. And there they are, and you can see on that left-hand side, uh, black circular device that's actually a, a radar and communications dish which can uh, be used to communicate to satellites above the, the uh, above the shuttle in low earth orbit to talk to mission control in houston and it can be also used in a radar mode if they're rendezvousing with 
things like satellites will repair or the International Space Station. So in its early years of operation, the shuttle, which was designed to replace all expendable launch vehicles, <laughs> that never happened, uh, was launching quite a lot of communication satellites for about the first third or 10 years of its operational life. And on the left hand image, you can see a couple of Hughes HS376 spinning communication satellites, uh, not really in surface anymore these days. They were a product of the 80s. And you can see one being launched um, on the right hand image. Uh, this is for the Australian government. It's called OSAT. Uh, quite a few of those were in use. They're still in use as OSAT, but they've been replaced by uh, different or three-dimensional, uh, three, um, yeah, three-dimensional satellites rather than spinning uh, satellites. And you can see it just spinning out of its uh, container. There's a wider view as you see it spinning and drifting away. Beneath the uh, communication satellite, you can see a little booster, which is used to uh, accelerate it to a much, much higher orbit. And I'll show you a diagram of that shortly. And that solid booster didn't always work, which is why the shuttle had to be used at times as a repairman and retrieve some of these where that booster didn't fire. This satellite is called Syncom. It was uh, built really for the military. Uh, it was built by uh, Hughes Aircraft Company and leased to uh, the Navy principally for communicating with ships worldwide. Um, it also span out of the cargo bay, but span in a different axis. It actually spun out like that, rather than the way you've just seen with the previous OSAT satellite. They didn't always spin out of the cargo bay. The tracking and data relay satellite, usually pronounced Tidarus, um, was uh, fitted to a rather large booster and this wasn't spun out of the bay, it was just pushed out to a safe distance where the booster would ignite. Now that is the satellite itself, the white thing immediately behind it is the booster all sat in a little cradle which can rotate. So on the left you can see the Tidra satellite lying flush in the cargo bay and on the right, you can see the cradle has rotated it up to a certain angle and then it's released and it passes over the top of the crew cabin and drifts off for quite a safe distance. There you can see it drifting away. And once it's got to a safe distance, that booster will ignite and uh, fire it up to a much higher orbit. Communication satellites need to be just over 22,000 miles above the equator. The shuttle usually orbits around about 150 to 200 miles, much, much lower. So why do they have to go to this magical altitude of 22,300 miles to be precise, or um, 36,000 kilometers? Well, at that altitude, which is about one tenth of the way to the moon, your orbital velocity is what you see there on the left, or lower left, 6,800 and a bit miles per hour. And at that orbital velocity, it takes the satellite precisely 24 hours to go all the way round. In other words, it stays directly above any fixed point on the Earth's surface. And those of you who have got sky satellite dishes will realize that if your sky satellite dish is pointing to the south, because we live in the northern hemisphere, so it needs to point to the south at a very precise angle. So it's pointing to that band in the sky directly above the equator where all these satellites are. And they're stationary compared to you as we rotate in our daily motion. So the satellite follows us. And that's why they have to be at this particular altitude. It's called the geostationary altitude, where the satellites are stationary relative to a fixed point on the Earth's surface. Interesting picture this. This is 
uh, this, you can see star trails, but at the tip of each line, you can actually see a white dot. Well, not only a white line, black lines as well. You can see a white dot. And those are geostationary satellites directly above the equator. <clears throat> and they're not moving, of course, because as the sky rotates, these satellites stay in a fixed position. It's the stars that are moving. Be interested to know, you astrophotographers, and I know you have a few in your society, some excellent ones, whether you've taken a picture like this and have imaged geostationary satellites. They're a bit faint, but I'd like to know if you've done it. So how do we get there? Well, as previously mentioned, the shuttle is in a low Earth orbit, about 150, 200 miles, and we need to get it up to about 22,000 miles. So clearly, these orbits are not to scale. So what the booster on the back of the satellite has to do is push it from a, or accelerate it really, to from a low orbit to geostationary altitude, where an, when, at that point, once it's done that, the booster will separate and an onboard rocket will ignite and circularize the orbit. So the satellite is launched from the cargo bay and the internal rocket motor fires to circularize the orbit once it reaches apogee or its furthest point at 22,000 miles. And I can show you that in a little animation. So that red represents the satellite. So the booster that we've seen ignites and accelerates it so that it goes from an almost circular orbit into a highly elliptical orbit. And at that point, the internal motor fires to circularize the orbit. And once it's done that, it can be positioned precisely at what longitude they want, whether it's above the Americas or above Europe or above Australasia or India or wherever it needs to be. And there's, there's hundreds of these positioned in geostationary orbit. And here's a diagram of that uh, geostationary orbit with lots and lots of satellites. It means that if we want to communicate to somebody on the other side of the world, we simply pick which satellite is best and a signal is sent to it and then immediately relayed back down to a ground station, which is beyond your horizon. So uh, the horizon is quite close to us on the ground. So we need to use a relay satellite just to send it round the corner, as it were, to areas we cannot see because they're hidden by the bulk of the Earth. My daughter lives in New Zealand. I was speaking to her only a couple of days ago. So we had to, I don't know which satellite was used by the telecommunications company, I've absolutely no idea. But there was virtually no delay from me talking to her. And when you consider my voice went over 22,000 miles up to the equator, or a satellite above the equator, then another 22,000 miles back down, and there was hardly any delay whatsoever. It's quite amazing. But um, as well as having geostationary satellites above the equator, we also have these tracking and data relay satellites. You saw one launched out the cargo bay earlier, the one that went over our heads effectively. Things like the Hubble Space Telescope, still sending back remarkable images, is often over the Pacific or over the Atlantic Ocean and out of touch with any ground station. But it doesn't communicate directly with the ground station in uh, Goddard Space Flight Center or near Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland in the United States. It doesn't try and communicate direct with them. It actually communicates up to a communication satellite, which then relays it down to Goddard. And that's why the antennas, the communication dishes on the Hubble Space Telescope don't point down to the Earth. They actually point up to a satellite where it's, uh, all the images are relayed. So once the mission is over, it's necessary to come back. And all that kinetic energy that we gained from the, uh, uh, the solid fuel and the liquid fuel has to be got rid of. When it comes back, 
it needs to, or as before it comes back, it needs to slow itself down just slightly from about 17,500 miles an hour down to about 17,200 miles an hour. And at that velocity, it doesn't have the energy to stay into orbit. So the orbit decays and it starts to re-enter, but in a controlled manner. So little rocket engines on the back of the orbiter, you can see them indicated there in red. There's one each on pods um, either side of the orbiter, just below the vertical uh, tail surface. Uh, and above the, uh, the three liquid fuel engines that were used for launch. They fire up for about a couple of minutes, which loses just enough energy to make the orbit decay. But you'll notice that the orbiter is flying backwards and upside down. Now, of course, you never see an aircraft do that because it's flying through, uh, through an atmosphere. But in space, of course, it's a vacuum. Therefore, you can actually travel in any orientation you wish uh, because it's a vacuum there's very very little resistance uh, so once it's fired those rockets going backwards it's necessary therefore to reorientate the orbiter so it's now aligning itself aligning the heat shield with its direction of travel and that nose has to be pitched up about 40 degrees a very precise angle as it hits the atmosphere because all that amount of energy that kinetic energy has to be dissipated and it's dissipated in the form of heat another form of energy and that nose and wing leading edges get very very hot remember what i said earlier that energy is neither created nor destroyed so the orbiter's kinetic energy changes its state into heat lots and lots of heat because the temperature on the nose and the wing leading edges get up to about 1500 degrees centigrade. That's more than hot enough to melt aluminium, which is what the orbiter body uh, is made of principally, as well as titanium. And aluminium would melt much, much lower than that. So it has a special heat shield, which stops the heat getting through to the skin of the orbiter. So energy is conserved as it comes through. And this is a terrific picture taken from the International Space Station after a visit by one of the orbiters, which of course is on the same orbital plane. So as it came into, into the atmosphere, it was flying just a, ahead of the International Space Station and the crew could actually photograph it. And you can see here it's streaking through the atmosphere, glowing white hot, an amazing picture. But then it starts to gradually transition from a spacecraft back into an aircraft. Up to about 50,000 feet, it's still using tiny little thrusters to maintain its orientation. But once it gets below 50,000 feet, the aero surfaces on the wing, leading, wing trailing edges and on the vertical tail start to take effect very, very slowly. And to help it dissipate heat, it first starts banking slowly to the left to do a little S turn, and then it starts to bank to the right. And the amount it banks left and the amount it banks to the right is all controlled by computers. Because the journey from space is about 4,000 miles. If it wants to land on, in Florida on the East Coast, it enters the Earth's atmosphere well over the Pacific and it travels halfway across the Pacific and halfway, well, most of the way across the United States of America, descending all the time because it has to slow from 17,500 miles an hour to about 210 miles an hour as it approaches the runway. And no human brain works fast enough, fast enough to do all the calculations on how much it needs to bank to the left and bank to the right. Now, this can only be done by a series of high speed computers. The key to the shuttle landing, and it is a glider after all, there are no engines on it that can do a fly around if the uh, landing goes not quite according to plan. Commercial airliners, if they mess up the approach, can just put on power, go around and try again. 
that happened to me once coming into Birmingham International Airport as a truck uh, unexpectedly or unexpectedly crossed the runway in front of us and the pilot had to just put on power and fly over him. I don't think um, they were very amused, so I've actually done a go around. But the shuttle cannot do that. So something called terminal area energy management comes into play. Sounds a bit technical, but just break it down into two distinct phrases. Terminal area means as you approach or get within about 50 miles of the runway. And energy management is carefully controlling what energy, which of course equates to your, your speed, how much you've got and how much more you've got to dissipate. You don't want to dissipate too much, otherwise you'll land short of the runway. And if you don't dissipate enough, you'll overshoot. You have to manage that energy very, very precisely on your approach. And it's very clever how they do that. This is the Kennedy Space Center. The black line uh, just below the word Wilson, almost in the center of the screen, is the orientation of the shuttle runway. It's about three miles long. The shuttle launch pads are to the right of that on the coast. And in the air, totally invisible, they're just defined by radar, are what they call heading alignment cylinders, or sometimes heading alignment circles. They don't exist, they're just defined by radar beams and the guidance system of the shuttle. The shuttle has to fly around one of those heading alignment cylinders to dissipate the final amount of energy and line it up with the runway. And you can, with any runway, just like any runway at Manchester Airport or Heathrow, runways can be approached from either end. You can either approach it from the southeast or you can approach it from the northwest. In our this diagram I'm about to show you, we're going to land from the southeast heading towards the northwest, so bottom to top effectively. So the shuttle could, as it comes in, approach from that angle, but it's coming in from the left hand side. It has to because that's the direction it's rotating in, the, in its orbit around the Earth. It's rotating, as we see it here, left to right. They never approach from the right. They always approach from the left at various angles. So if it comes in here from the southwest, you can see it's at right angles to the, the runway. So it picks up this heading alignment cylinder defined by the radar and guidance system, and it flies round it, which I've just put there in red. And as it flies round it, it precisely aligns with the end of the runway. And bear in mind, this is a two dimensional diagram. I'll show you a three dimensional one in a moment. But as it's going round that heading alignment cylinder, it's also losing altitude as well. And depending on which orbit you come in on, you could come in more from the west rather than the southwest. But again, you pick up that heading alignment cylinder, fly round it until you are aligned with the end of the runway. You could come in from the northwest, and they often do. You just pick up the heading alignment cylinder later, fly around it, and it aligns you up. So this is the three-dimensional view of a heading alignment cylinder that comes in from the right. WP1 is just waypoint one, then it starts to fly around it. But now you can see as it's going round, it's also descending all the time until it reaches what they call the nominal energy point. Uh, you may have heard, if you've seen any shuttle landings, you may have heard the, the communication with the, uh, the pilots on board saying that they are on energy. That means they've hit that nominal energy, energy point at the right time and traveling at the right velocity. And that nominal energy point is about 42,000 feet, that's still quite a few miles from the end of the runway. And this now is computer graphics of a shuttle orbiter coming into land at Kennedy Space Center. And it's flying round the hack or heading alignment cylinder. It comes out of the hack as it sees the 
the runway, and the pilots often use the, the phrase field in sight, meaning they have seen the runway. It's an old pilot's expression when runways were known as landing, site, landing fields. In fact, in World War I and II, of course, they were in fact fields rather than concrete runways, which is what the shuttle landing strip is. So field in sight means the crew have turned on the hack and they can see the runway ahead of them. And this is a view out the pilot's window um, with the head up display showing the runway. And can you see that little circle just there? That is where the computer guidance system predicts they will touch down. Uh, on the left here, you've got numbers. Uh, 290, 300, 310, that's velocity in knots. You've also got altitude. And down at the bottom there, the screen says OGS, meaning that it's on the glide slope. It's coming in at the right angle, and the guidance system expects it to touch down at the point indicated on that head-up display. And so here she is coming in. The landing gear is not down at this point. The air brakes are out. You can see that on the vertical rudder. The rudder, um, which controls your, in either your left or right, uh, this rudder here is now split into two halves, which causes drag. So that's an air brake slowing it down. Ooh, quite late in the approach, the landing gear drops down and the nose starts to pitch up. It's called a flare as the nose pitches up. There it is. There's the nose pitched up. So the main gear touches down first and pilots keep the nose up in the air to create drag as uh, forward velocity bleeds off slowly. Then eventually there's insufficient forward velocity to keep the nose up. So the nose starts to drop down and the nose gear hits the runway. And as the nose gear hits the runway, on later flights, after flight 25, which was the loss of Space Shuttle Challenger, after that, all orbiters carried this retarding parachute, which pops out as soon as the nose gear touches down. That creates a huge amount of drag to slow it down, and it just has less wear and tear on the brakes. But just before the orbiter rolls to a stop, that parachute is released so it doesn't get tangled up in anything. There it is, it's gone. Uh, the orbiter's going quite slow at this point. Then eventually it comes to wheels stop. So all that enormous amount of energy that it had in space, 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, has now been dissipated. So the energy state of the orbiter is now exactly as it was when it was on the launch pad. Energy state nil. Now, <clears throat> how many times have we heard that? Theory and practice are not always the same thing. Good grief. So I want to talk to you about when uh, the theory and practice definitely did not go according to plan. There were 135 uh, launches of the Space Shuttle. One failed on the way up, one failed on the way down. And we can't have any history of the Space Shuttle without talking about those two flights for a short, short while. I won't dwell on this, they're almost a talk in their own right, but I'll just briefly outline what happened. Let's look at um, the loss of Challenger first, January 1986. This was an issue, an ongoing issue, which was known about and identified on earlier flights involving the joints of the boosters. Recall that they are made in Utah and they come on rail carriages from Utah in individual segments which have to be built up together at the Kennedy Space Center. And this is one of those joints and those joints, uh, which is called a field joint, is sealed in the early days by two uh, O-rings. The yellow arrow is pointing where the big neoprene O-rings are. The yellow arrow in the inset picture shows you those two O-rings. This makes the joint flexible uh, and seals against any hot gases generated in the inside of the booster from escaping to the outside. But on some flights in the early days, 
uh, there were evidence of hot gases impinging on those o-rings and um, uh, what happened to those and the recovery program goes down in history because insufficient effort was put into that and a tragedy occurred in 1986. Those neoprene o-rings have to be or remain quite flexible uh, to encounter all the bending movements as the booster, I beg your pardon, as the liquid fuel engines on the orbiter ignite, it pushes the top of the orbiter forward about two feet and it causes the boosters, the solid fuel boosters, to flex and bend slightly. So those joints have to be flexible with these neoprene rings. On the day of launch, 28th of January, 86, unusually for Florida weather, it was extremely cold. You can see here pictures of the uh, launch pad immediately prior to launch with icicles on it. Those neoprene O-rings were being asked to operate in temperatures never before experienced. And neoprene, when it gets cold, does not get be so flexible. And there were engineers screaming out that there is no test evidence that these neoprene O-rings will retain their re uh, flexibility at these cold temperatures. Despite that, the launch was allowed to take place immediately on booster ignition. One of the boosters experienced an event, as the engineers call it. The arrow is pointing to hot gases coming out the field joint and puffing out uh, with the flexibility of the, as the engines ignited, as the uh, the flexibility just started to stabilize and then it goes straight up. It was puffing out slightly. This was not immediately seen at launch. Um, it was seen in post-launch photography. Here's another view, not seen on the original footage, but seen from a different angle. And you can see on the left image, the yellow arrow is pointing to where hot gases are escaping through the lower field joint. This is bad news. You cannot shut these boosters down. Once you ignite a solid fuel booster, it has to burn out before you can jettison it. And we didn't know about this uh, escaping through the field joint because it wasn't seen from the launch camera angle we were actually looking at. At about 70 odd seconds, after launch, that lower field joint had been eroded to the point when the attachment point to the booster and the external tank severed, allowing the bottom of the booster to move outwards away from the external tank, causing the upper part, the conical part, to touch the upper part of the external tank and pierce it. It had a big conical nose. It pierced the external tank, which houses liquid oxygen. And you can see on the right hand image, the moment the external tank is ruptured by that uh, wayward solid fuel boosters, causing liquid oxygen to flow right down the sides of the vehicle and into the uh, exhaust plume of the rocket engines causing an enormous explosion. On the left hand image you can see one of the boosters which is now separated from the external tank and going its own path. A destruct command was later sent to that to blow it up and the other booster as well. On the right hand side you can see debris emanating from the explosive cloud. The arrow is pointing to the crew cabin with the seven astronauts in it. There is nothing they could do. This is a picture taken of the booster after it was recovered from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see the hole that had burnt through the casing. And this problem with the O-rings had been identified, but insufficient work had been done to correct it. Over the next two and a half years, corrective procedures were put in place and the boosters were, were experienced no further difficulties from flight 26 through to flight 
135 uh, many years later. The other issue was with Columbia, 1st of February 2003. The other issue the shuttle system was having was the shedding of the orange uh, insulation on the external tank, uh, which kept falling off. And this had been going on for quite some time. It never seemed to be an issue because foam is very light. Nobody experienced any issues with it. There's the forward attachment point, And it was in that area where the foam kept coming from. No one expected this very, very light foam to have any problem whatsoever. But on this particular flight, a piece of foam quite large hit the wing leading edge. And you can see it there. Having hit the wing leading edge, it's now falling below the wing. What we didn't know was that it had actually blown a small hole into the wing leading edge. You can see in that inset picture a piece of foam falling away. On this occasion, it went below the wing and had no, no difficulties whatsoever. So the hole in the wing leading edge was where that lower red arrow is. Uh, that wing leading edge is made of something called reinforced carbon carbon. If you're interested in Formula One cars, then brakes of Formula One cars are made of the same material. They can withstand extremely high temperatures. In the case of Columbia, the hole was just forward of the, uh, the, the footwell holding the left main undercarriage. The arrows are now repositioning to point out where the undercarriage is. And the first indications that something was wrong was temperature sensors on those wheels saying they were getting extremely hot as it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. So this is a photograph of the wing leading edge showing those carbon carbon panels. And this is one under test where about a kilogram of this foam was fired at about 500 miles an hour. The speed that Columbia was traveling as it was uh, launched at the moment of impact. And the engineers couldn't believe it that that just one kilogram of foam traveling at 500 miles an hour blew a hole in the wing leading edge. And there it is. Couldn't believe it. But it happened so that when it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, the, that, those temperatures that I mentioned earlier, 1500 degrees, were going through into the wing and causing it to melt and flex and eventually start losing control. In the bottom right, you can see uh, an image, long range tracking image uh, of it coming in. And you can see on the starboard side, the wing leading edge is quite smooth. But on the port side, you can see it's quite jagged. Uh, there was something seriously wrong with that wing leading edge. And that eventually, of course, led to the destruction of Columbia on the way in with six, uh, with seven crew again. Uh, you can see the title that I put for this talk. I will just show you that with no comment. It doesn't need any. So that um, just gives you a background of the loss of two orbiters, Challenger and Columbia, and 14 crew, uh, four women and 10 men on the 25th and 113th shuttle flights. Once flights resumed again uh, after the loss of Columbia, uh, the role of the, the shuttle altered slightly and it went more into a role of satellite repair and assembly of the International Space Station, which we'll discuss more in part three. To enable with satellite repairs, this jet pack uh, or manned maneuvering unit as uh, NASA would like to call it, uh, was developed. It was, had been developed many, many years, and one was going to be tested during the Gemini missions in the 1960s, but uh, it uh, never, that particular mission didn't conduct that, uh, conduct that particular experiment for a whole string of reasons, which I won't go into. Uh, but it's powered by nitrogen gas, compressed nitrogen. So as the astronauts operate the controls, it fire, fires up various little thrusters, which gives puffs of nitrogen gas, which is quite safe. 
which can pitch, roll, and yaw that uh, man maneuvering unit. Uh, that was computer graphics on that image, but this isn't. This is a real picture of Bruce McCandless, uh, who became an artificial satellite in his own right and drifted quite a bit away from the, uh, the orbiter. And there he is, the human satellite. He was even given his own designation because he was an individual satellite in his own right, if only for an hour or two. And this is just an inset of Bruce McCandless as he was a few years ago, many years after that particular flight. And that man maneuvering unit was needed on more than one occasion. I did say earlier that those boosters attached to satellites didn't always fire. Uh, and it didn't on this one. So they had to try and retrieve the satellite. These things cost hundreds of millions of dollars. You can't just waste them. So they tried to retrieve this one. And the astronaut went out there to capture it underneath with a special device and bring it back into the cargo bay where they would put it in special cradles and attached a new booster to it and it was successfully redeployed. The same thing happened on this particular flight, a much bigger satellite, still a drum shaped spinning satellite, but quite a bit bigger than the one we've just seen. There's another picture out of it, out one of the cockpit windows with an astronaut at the back of the satellite attaching a special bar so that the robotic arm on the orbiter can pick it up and bring it back into the cargo bay. And here it is being brought into the cargo bay. This took three astronauts to, to do that and position it on special cradles where they attach the new booster, which you can see in, back, in black. And this new booster did successfully fire and took that satellite up to geostationary orbit. So this ability to do this, capture and repair satellites in orbit, was a unique capability that the Americans had with the shuttle. No other nation had that. On this particular flight, they retrieved a science satellite called the Solar Maximum Mission that had run out of fuel. After quite a few years, I may add, they captured it and put it on a special cradle in the back of the, uh, the shuttle cargo bay. And that's an overlay, but in almost exactly the same position, with astronauts working on it, refueling it, changing some of the instrumentation. And once they'd serviced it, they released it. And the Solar Maximum mission continued its views and science operation looking at our sun. But not only did it um, launch communication satellites, and it did quite a few of those, and not only did it Re retrieve and repair satellites and sometimes they brought them back down to earth uh, as well as relaunching them into uh, into orbit they launched a few science missions uh, in 1989 they launched galileo towards jupiter uh, magellan towards venus that radar mapping mission towards venus see that in the bottom right and in the upper right, the uh, Ulysses spacecraft, which uh, was actually launched towards Jupiter only because they wanted Jupiter's enormous gravitational pull to change the inclination of the orbit of Ulysses into a high inclination orbit over the north and south poles of the sun. That would have taken a huge amount of energy to do that. Um, but if you launch it towards Jupiter and accept you're going to have a bit of a time penalty, which was not an issue, you can use the gravity of Jupiter to, to bend your orbit or bend your trajectory so it goes above, above the north and south poles of the sun. And that gravity of Jupiter, of course, is quite free. Just go and get it. They also launched two enormous satellites that only the shuttle could launch the big gamma ray observatory which was extremely heavy and could only be launched by the shuttle was launched in 1991 and the chandra x-ray observatory which took up 
practically the whole of the 60 foot long 15 foot wide cargo bay it's enormous the, the chandra x-ray observatory i checked yesterday and 21 years after launch it's still operating amazing so in summary what did the shuttle achieve in its uh, era of a satellite launcher and repairman well it launched a total of 34 communications satellites it retrieved or repaired five saved a lot of insurance money it launched a total of 12 missions for the department of defense we assume they were spy satellites but the exact missions were never released there was a total of 16 science satellites of various descriptions and as we saw a few slides ago there was three interplanetary mission launches now drop in a red line because that's above the red line is launches out of the cargo bay below it are other missions so there was six missions to the uh, space telescope to launch and repair the space telescope uh, 29 missions were to space lab discussed in part three and also discussed in part three 10 missions to the mir space station the russian space station and the one that the uh, shuttle orbiter was absolutely built for building the international space station of which 37 missions were dedicated solely to that but we look at that in part three so i think my allotted time is just about up so at some point i think it's halfway through february we'll be able to look at the space shuttle history part three science and assembly and will that i will relinquish my screen and hand you back peter thank you very much once again uh, a very uh, interesting and insightful talk into the uh, the workings of the space shuttle thank you very much uh, we come to that part of the evening uh, where it's questions so um as always if you can indicate if you want to ask a question with a blue hand preferably otherwise will you wave at me remember that there are more people attending than i can see in one go so it takes me a few uh moves across um peter the um the mmu yes uh bruce mccandless is uh uh use of it and other astronauts as well uh nasa nasa has really uh, cooled on the idea of the mmu in recent years hasn't it um yes well they've they've nothing to fly it on um it was originally developed as i mentioned earlier during the 1960s and was going to be tested um on gemini which it wasn't they did fly it on skylab 1973 and 1974 they did take one up uh, they didn't fly it in space they actually flew it inside the skylab laboratory and, and because the thrusters are nitrogen gas perfectly safe to use that then it tended to as you rightly point out go a bit cold uh, and it wasn't used for quite some time it was just sort of part but it was re re resurrected for satellite retrieval and it was used quite a few times and without that manned maneuvering unit we simply could not have retrieved those satellites it's quite a simple but remarkable device to enable astronauts to move around independently in space because prior to that if an astronaut needed to go into the cargo bay of the shuttle as soon as they came out the airlock and into the cargo bay the first thing they did was um, connect to their spacesuit a safety harness 
So if for any reason um, they got nudged or pushed off, uh, they would float away from the orbiter only a few meters and then the rope would just stop them and bring them back down and they could pull themselves back on the rope. On the rope. So if you needed to maneuver down the cargo bay of the shuttle, you had to keep moving this rope with you. It was a safety harness and quite rightly so. The manned maneuvering unit got away with that and it enabled people to move freely around in space and also of course inspect the underside of the orbiter at some of the heat shield tiles. Um, and they weren't always staying on, but, uh, but yes, it was cold, went cold for quite a while, but then it was resurrected. Um, there's no use for it at the moment uh, because there's simply no vehicle to fly it on. Right. Uh, we've, we've, we've taken a big step back from the shuttle. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, questions. Do we have anybody wanting to ask a question? Looking around, can't see anybody. Oh, go on then, Philip. Yeah, and what, what, uh, I heard an expert talking about the man manoeuvring unit, and they said one of the things was if it went wrong, they would have no way of retrieving an astronaut using the, using the system. And I was under the impression that they got cold feet using it for health and safety reasons. Um, I don't totally agree with that. Um, had the man manoeuvring unit thrusters packed in, for instance, on McCandless, and he was stranded a couple of hundred meters away from the orbiter, then the commander of the orbiter could simply, using the onboard thrusters of the orbiter, um, approach him mm. and, and capture him. Um, this, this never happened in reality. Uh, no. I do remember one piece of hardware which hadn't been locked down fully drifting away from the orbiter and it went out the cargo bay and the crew simply chased it because <laughs> um, the commander would be looking out the aft facing windows towards the cargo bay and could see what was happening and he can control the position, uh, the translation if you like, of the orbiter uh, from the, uh, from the um, station overlooking the cargo bay. And this actually happened. Hoot Gibson did it. So if it had gone wrong with uh, Bruce McCandless, they could have gone and retrieved him. You okay, thanks. Out there, would you? <laughs> well, I do believe that. Uh, did a, if I seem to remember on Space Shuttle, a, uh, an astronaut lost a tool bag. Yes. Yeah, there was so, one, or two, one or two tools went overboard. Yeah, but a whole yeah, I, think, I, I think it was a lady that lost a handbag as well, wasn't it, Paul? Do you see, you see, you see, Philip, I said astronaut. I did not <laughs> assign blue at all. So I did sell a day. It's, it's Christmas. It's Christmas, <laughs> Philip. Be generous. Yes, the word astronaut is without gender. Quite right. So. <laughs> and, and, and my daughter, who's in New Zealand, I mentioned her earlier, uh, she is named... Catherine, and it's spelt the same way as the first American female spacewalker, Catherine Sullivan. Okay. And so my daughter was named after an American spacewalking astronaut. All right, ladies and gents, I'm looking for questions. I don't see any blue hands. I'm looking for people waving at me. Uh, I thought Trevor Worrell was going to wave at me, but no. I don't see anything. So, ladies and gents, uh, oh, hold on, Catherine. We've got a Catherine there. Catherine, can you unmute yourself? Hello, yes, Catherine. Just unmuted, yes. Um, on, on the uh, Burian, it actually did a complete launch uh, without any crew on board. And for the Starship, Elon Musk is trying to uh, uh, get the Starship to orbit without any crew on board. I can't remember them, them ever doing that for the shuttle. Is, is that correct? Uh, you're absolutely correct. It always flew with a crew on board. Um, the crew were there really for on-orbit operations. Yeah. On the way up, the crew had little to do other than monitor their instruments. They could take some corrective action, but effectively, because of the speed the shuttle was going, only a computer 
uh, can work at that fast and do the necessary calculations. So on the way up, the crew are really hands off. And when it comes back through the atmosphere, the crew are essentially hands off until they get to about 50,000 feet and it transitions from a spacecraft to an aircraft and then the crew uh, start to take over and the flying round the heading alignment cylinder is done by the mission commander in the left seat and he flies it around that cylinder and actually puts it onto the, the runway. The shuttle did have an auto land capability where the shuttle could come all the way from orbit and land on the runway with the astronauts sat on their hands effectively. But bear in mind these astronauts are test pilots and if you'll pardon the expression no way in hell were they not landing the shuttle themselves. So the auto land capability was never used, but it was there as a backup. And um, when we were talking about ladies earlier, there were in fact two lady mission commanders who actually landed the shuttle and did it brilliantly, as good as any bloke. Thank you, Catherine. Have you got a follow-up question? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, do you think that was a safe way of doing it for the maiden flight? A safe way of doing it for the maiden uh, of, uh, of for the maiden flight uh, of the shuttle or future vehicles uh, for the shuttle well, yeah. well i mean it's, it's a big risk isn't it like, i mean something that's never flown before you actually put a, a crew on there uh, yes um and in fact it was the very first time a manned spacecraft had mm. been flown into space with a crew on board on its maiden flight yeah. If you look at the American yeah. previous missions like Mercury, Gemini and Apollo, unmanned spacecraft went up first. Yeah. With the shuttle, it went up with a, yeah. manned, uh, a manned crew first. I'm using the word manned here in the non-sexy connotation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a manned, it's so, it's always a manned crew to me, not person's crew. Yeah. I'm not going to fall for PC correctness. <laughs> it was a man crew, and, and but the whole system was de designed for a man or person or woman in the loop, <laughs> because when on the sh the maiden launch of Columbia, <laughs> it it had a lot of experiments to do on orbit as well. Wow. And this was best done with the crew in the cockpit. Yeah. It was a quite complex machine, so it was the first manned vehicle to fly with a crew on its maiden launch. A good yeah. observation you make there, Catherine. Yes, yeah, so thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, just, uh, thank you. Just going back to the uh, some of the uh, characteristics of the shuttle, Peter. Uh, when you were talking about the uh, flight approach and your three D di diagram, uh, yeah. I noticed the figures for the the height and range when it left the uh, the cylinder. Yes, and I think it was twelve thousand and twelve thousand feet and forty-two thousand feet out. Yes, and that gives it a glide angle of something like uh, one to three and a half, which is atrocious. It's very very steep. Um, it's much much steeper than if you were flying back from the Canary Islands. You'd have a nice gentle glide slope. The orbiter descent rate was very very high a very very steep angle uh, in fact on some of that computer graphics I showed looking through the cockpit window you can see the orbit is still quite high yet the runway is really approaching uh, so the descent rate was very very high and your observation is very sound and a good one too well I was just trying to think back to my gliding days and uh, the glide angle for a standard uh, glider I can't remember if it was uh, 1 to 24 or 1 to 12 but if you compare your standard glider no power coming in very nicely and gently uh, being 1 to 12 say comparing yeah. that to 1 to 3 and a half <laughs> uh, it's it's very very steep yes catches a lot of pilots out 
um because they're, they're used to a much shallower approach angle uh, yeah. which is why any crew will have done at least 500 landings in the simulator before they attempt it for real did they not did they not use a um one of their training craft the t2s um, and they they, they used they, a gulf stream aircraft yeah and they they stuck a computer in there that actually uh, made the thing react like the shuttle yes they did um the left seat and the cockpit, in, the cockpit instruments were made to look like the orbiter and the right hand seat was conventional um it had some special fins put on it drag fins so that it could come up come in at a very steep angle um it i think it even came in with thrust reversers on and this was a, a modified gulfstream aircraft and they would fly lots and lots of approaches with that at a very very steep angle um it had to come into the steep angle and come in very fast as well because it, it landed at about 210 220 knots which is very fast um you look at a commercial airliner coming in jumbo jet would come in at about 140 boeing 737 about 120 uh, so it came in about 210 220 knots very very fast uh, it had to come in quite fast because with the wing shape it had its stall speed was quite high uh, below about 210 knots it could stall and just drop out the sky so they had to keep the speed up very very hairy landing i wouldn't fancy doing one. Oh well <laughs> i'm sure if somebody bought you a ticket at the time peter you'd oh, have uh, you'd have ripped their arms off yeah gary gorthrop has got a question oh go on then gary uh, well, I, I was fortunate a few years ago to see a shuttle launch, uh, and, but, and, and it was a fairly short mission. So uh, on the same trip, we were able to see it land. Uh, and uh, as you say, it came in very quick. It took us quite a, a while to see it. And if actually, if there wasn't some people there that knew what they were looking for, I don't think we'd have seen it. Um, but from Titusville, where we were observing it from, uh, the shuttle went below the top of the VAB so Ooh, that must have yeah. been so it's almost like it comes in quite steep but it must um, make that angle a lot shallower because the, the VAB is not particularly close to the the end of the runway where they're aiming at yeah okay thank you for that Gary yeah, I, I, although I never saw a shuttle launch I was actually there um, when one was coming into land and I got myself positioned absolutely perfect. Um, but just before it re-entered, the wind, which had been moving around a bit, veered to a different angle. So when, it, when they re-entered, they told them to come in and approach the runway from the opposite end. <laughs> so, so, I oh. was at, so I was at one end of the runway and it came in from the other. Oh, we, we were at the southern end of the runway and it, it, it passed in front of us. Yeah. Um, but it, it was it was quite interesting, like you said, the the, the actual cone that the fly we, we couldn't pick it up on that cone anywhere, and it was only literally on its last probably yeah. few seconds before landing that we saw it. Uh, like we heard the sonic boom as it, oh, yes. as, it as it came through the, the sound barrier, but uh, well, that, it was that rattles a few windows. <laughs> it, it was surprisingly quiet. You could hear it, but it was surprisingly quiet. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Gary. Okay, ladies and gents, uh, I can't see anybody else wanting to ask a question. So, can we? Oh, hold on. Roy's waving at me just when you think it's safe to say something. Go on, Roy. Well, it's just a comment. Uh, while you were talking, I was just doing a quick check. Um, that you know, Robin, uh, many people will have gone to Robin Hood's Bay and that steep hill down into Robin Hood's Bay. <laughs> that's about the flight path of the shuttle. Wow. Fair enough. I'll, I'll, I'll drive up there and, and drive down it. Well, you can't. I think it's blocked off now. But that steep hill that goes down to the to, to the jetty at Robin Hood's Bay, the steepest part of that, it, according to the internet, was one in four. So that's that's about that's good enough. That's a good. <laughs> that's, about yes. Bay. Uh, that's about shuttle landing angle. <laughs> right. Okay. 
that's that's even more worrying. Oh, Catherine wants to have a quick word again. Yes. Uh, are there any plans to to do another shuttle in the in the future or not? Uh, using modern <laughs> technology. If if there is, it's so far in the future, it's out of sight. Um, <laughs> You, uh, it, could, it could be decades away, and I, I don't think I'll be around to talk about that. <laughs> the, yeah. I'd, I'd look at if you're interested, Catherine, in that sort of thing. I would look yeah. at two sites. Yes. First one is the Sierra Nevada Corporation. Oh, I know that one. Yes. yes. Um, and they have mm. got a contract with ESA, I think, to fly a shuttle-type mm. vehicle for cargo. Uh, to the International Space Station and also Reaction Engines oh, yeah. who are doing the uh, uh, the uh, Sabre engine yeah. and uh, within a bigger project the Skylon uh, space plane. Uh, thank you. Just interject Paul. Yes. Yeah the, there is at the moment the XB37 or is it the X37B can't remember which configuration number it is but that is a mini shuttle that is a mini shuttle I and think, it's completely automated I think Sierra oh that's the one that the uh, Boeing are flying for the American military yeah the, I, I don't know what they're doing with it I think it's on its second flight now it's completely automated it's not an identical shuttle but it's 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 a very similar okay uh, uh, kind of spacecraft. Peter, it, 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 it's on its fifth flight. Oh, is it fifth? Yeah. 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 Um, it's it's, it's the second one I know about. It, it's, it looks a bit like the shuttle, but it's, as you rightly point out, fully automated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 it's a d design principle, but it is different. Yeah, yeah the, I think it's been, I think it's been solely used by the Amer the American military. Yeah, I yes. think it is. Well, they're all secret. They're all secret missions at the moment, aren't they? Yes, yeah. and 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 they're all unmanned. Yeah. yeah, just out of interest, you can actually see it. I've tried to go out and observe it a few times. Every time it's been visible, it's been cloudy. Uh, Phil, do you want me to edit that comment out? <laughs> just, <laughs> from I just thought that you wouldn't want that putting on the internet. You never know who's listening. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's, uh, it's getting on and uh, I think we should let Peter go. Um, so, can we not only wish him a happy Christmas and uh, a safe new year, but can we also thank him for this evening's excellent talk with a big Mexborough and Swinton thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everybody.